Thanks, Barbara. To flesh out the mayor's race, we are joined by a panel of political experts. They are Kristen McQuarrie, a member of the Chicago Tribune editorial board, Angel Garcia, president emeritus of the Chicago Young Republicans, and Cliff Kelly, journalist and radio host on WVON, and welcome everybody. Thank you. Thank you. So as Pleasure. we just heard, uh, the mayor is inching up there to that 50 percent plus one mark that he needs to avoid a runoff. The poll that we just had from the Tribune shows him at 45 percent. Commissioner Garcia far back at 20 percent. And Kristen, does the mayor clearly have the momentum as we're approaching Election Day? I think he does. I mean, I've been saying all along I don't think he's going to have a runoff. I think it's going to be very close. But there's 18 percent undecided. He's going to be on the air from now until Election Day. And I think he's going to capture enough of that undecided vote to push him over the edge. I don't think we're going to have a runoff, even though I wish we did. I, it would give us a chance to vet more of the city's issues. I agree with her. I, I wish we would, too. Uh, that, the only thing I'm hoping is that some people have told me that the, the ads are oversaturation. People are tired of hearing about what Emmanuel has done. Many of those things are false. They're fabrications. A lot of things he said he's done he hasn't done. And the people that I hear from are particularly talking about the safety in the neighborhoods. One thing that I'm surprised that hasn't been talked about, you're not even safe in his own neighborhood. His son gets mugged right outside of his house. And something's funny about that. Well, Alderman Fioretti did try to make that an issue. It was quickly tamped down. Yeah. Looking at the, at the poll, Angel, we still see 18 percent undecided. That's almost one in five voters. Can that still make a difference, that large number of undecided, just a few days before the election? Well, if we look at a January poll, we see that the mayor was at 50 percent. He's down to 45. So I think that there is a chance for a runoff. I think that it's going to be out to turnout. Um, mm -hmm. The teachers' unions. Uh, have a stake in this and if they can turn out the vote and we have a the type of turnout we usually have I think they can stop the mayor from getting the 50 percent plus one. But Chewy Garcia who is the next closest candidate is back at 20 percent. He's 25 points behind Emmanuel. Are you surprised that he hasn't done more to move up in this race? Well it, it's tough to get the attention right. Uh, there's so many people running uh, but I am surprised. Uh, he is running to the left of the mayor it seems that he has the mantle as the leftist progressive candidate. Uh, he has the endorsement of Karen Lewis. Uh, yeah. So I thought he would do a little bit better. Uh, but at this point, it's not about getting close to the mayor. It's about forcing the runoff. And I think that he might be in a position yeah. to do it. And if Karen was in the race, we wouldn't be having that discussion. Well, well she's not. And Kristen, right. what about all those undecided? I mean, I think, I think it's indicative of people. I think the anti-ROM vote is, are the counted votes. When we do these polls, if you're anti-ROM, you're hitting the button in these phone polls for someone else. So that's why I think those undecideds are people who just are reluctant to get behind him because as we, as we know, he's, he's unpopular, he's unlikable, but he makes the best case. We endorsed him um, for re-election. As did everybody else, the Sun-Times, Crane, correct. Chicago Business, the Daily Defender, everybody endorsed right. ROM. Basically. So I think there's a reluctance of people to get behind him, but by election day, I believe they will. And turnout, as you said, is going to be so important. He's got the the organization. He's got the aldermen in black wards behind him who are going to get people to the polls. And the other, the other candidates don't have that kind of an operation. Well, then, too, one you've one got of the, the one of the surprising things in. I just want to mention yeah. in this mm -hmm. poll is looking back at the last Tribune poll, clearly Rahm Emanuel is moving up among African Americans, the constituency with which he had the most difficulty. What do you think accounts for the fact that African Americans now seem to be moving uh, toward Rahm? Well, I'm not sure of that. I, I, I've seen a lot of polls that turn out not to be factual at the, the time that they vote. The president's coming in for him. Uh, you know, it's not about that historic park, which I'm very much in favor of, for different reasons, however. But uh, I hope the president is as, as successful uh, coming in for Rahm as he was for Pat Quinn. You know, and, and you're, you're suggesting that, it, that that endorsement doesn't matter so exactly. much. Exactly. Well, but, people, you know, it's not just, it's not just President uh, Obama, for example. Uh, Emmanuel has been campaigning with Bobby Rush, uh, the congressman, That's who a was, who to was a lot of very people. critical yeah. of Emmanuel about the school closing. Exactly. Well, when we look at Ron, we saw when he won the, won the first time, he did it with support from Latino and black communities. So where does that support come from? I do think that being the chief of staff for President Obama, uh, is something very powerful. Having the president come in for him is very powerful. Uh, you know, the question is, has anyone been able to rally uh, the black communities where the schools were closed uh, against no. Rahm? It has no. not happened to where we thought it would. 
Um, so I think uh, Rahm has done a very good job in the black communities. And Kristen, given that lingering anger over the school closings and also the violent crime, are you surprised that Emmanuel is doing as well as he is, according to this poll, among African-American voters? I am, actually. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with these television ads that he was smart about, you know, going out in the beginning and talking about how he raised the minimum wage, all day kindergarten. He is, that is exactly the audience that he's trying to target. Um, I think a lot of the school closure issue has died down somewhat. Um, in 34 wards, they do have an elected school board on the ballot. So in terms of mobilizing CTU, that will be a factor. But I have been surprised that, um, I mean, those are the areas where he's so vulnerable and nobody has the money to go after him. That's you know, true. I live in the city, I'm getting mailers, um, anti-Fioretti, anti-Garcia. No one has the resources to hit him where it counts. Well, you mentioned the money, we talked about it in the opening piece mm -hmm. with Barbara. That's a huge factor here. As the opening report suggested, he has outraised his opponents basically 30 to 1. You're, absolutely, and that does make a big difference. And as was pointed out, he's raised so much money for so many other people, and of course, the governor, the now governor, is a good friend of his, helped him raise money uh, in, in the private sector, of course. And he's got a lot of friends and people are giving him money because they need his services and the things that they want from city government. It makes a big difference. The only person that can come anywhere near is uh, Willie Wilson. He's and, put in uh, about $2 million. Exactly, of his own money. His own yeah, money. And, and other people. And Emmanuel's raised more than $30 million when you add exactly. up all of his different campaign committees. Mm -hmm. Angel, what difference does that make? It makes all the difference in the world. Sure. Um, we see that the, that Rom is vulnerable on many issues, but if you can't reach out and let the voters know about that, you right. might as well not have those issues uh, be a weakness. So money is everything, because that's how you reach voters, uh, whether it's mailers or television or radio. And uh, all the oxygen in the room has been taken by Rom. And Chris, at what point does the money itself become an issue? As we heard, uh, he's being criticized for accepting donations from developers. In fact, the biggest donations come from developers and from the trade unions. Right. Um, well, that's where, you know, he can, he can get his talking points out and no one has the money to, to kind of get him off of his talking points. We heard him earlier say that, you know, that was one of the first executive orders he signed was he was not going to accept campaign contributions from people who did, did business with City Hall. Clearly, that's not the case. And mm -hmm. our newsroom has caught him a number of times breaking that promise and forcing him to have to give campaign funds back. But again, the pay-to-play accusation is being, you know, it's making headlines, but yeah. nobody has the money to put it on the air. And the other thing about this money thing, and I totally agree with you, is the fact that his PAC is going after progressive aldermen. He doesn't even want someone to, to vote against any of these things he comes up with. And to do that is just, I, I think... Isn't that disturbing? That's, it's he very has disturbing. A, he, he wants has to control the a huge consensus on the city council. Only five or six yeah. people ever vote Eight. against him. Exactly. And a lot of them are very well-reasoned and good exactly. aldermen, mm -hmm. and he is targeting them. He will not even accept yeah, that's, that's wrong. any dissent on the city council. As you were suggesting, the city council already votes with the mayor about 90% of the time, and his political action committee is raising money to defeat aldermen who have been independent. Right. Oh, yeah. Well, we see that the mayor uh, wants things the way he wants them, uh, and he has the money to go after uh, thorns in his side. Uh, so it's not even about the runoff. Sometimes we'll see how powerful the mayor is by seeing what happens in the aldermanic races, and I'm not sure that the PACs will uh, get Ron what he needs. I think the, a lot of the aldermen that have been the progressive left wing mm -hmm. are very strong, have strong community ties, and uh, that money may not uh, be as effective as the mayor thinks. The theme of Chewy Garcia's campaign, as we heard from Barbara's uh, opening piece, is that there are two Chicagos. That there's the glittering downtown, which is Rom Chicago, and as Garcia says, I'm the neighborhood guy. Why hasn't that worked better? I don't know why it hasn't worked better, because it's certainly truthful. I mean, when you look at the South and the West Side, of course, as many of the candidates have talked about, there's a total difference. The TIF for the tax increment financing has not been utilized as it should have been. And uh, I don't know why that hasn't caught on. I guess this again, as you, as you mentioned, it's the money. And able to say, it's just like when he's uh, on the debates, the ones he does show at. Doesn't matter what the question is, the answer's gonna be the same. <laughs> you know, what, well, could it be that Chicago doesn't really want a neighborhood guy? I, I, think, I, think that's an, I think it's absolutely true that we are a tale of two cities. Right. I think it's more of an issue of the candidates. Rob Emanuel's opponents, none of them has, has really caught fire. Nobody has the spark. Even people around um, Garcia are constantly trying to make him more 
fiery and, and pump him up. And they just, they're, they're missing that spark. They had one of them had some following like a Karen Lewis. I think that argument would have more traction. And I think we have to give the mayor some credit. Uh, he has worked in the communities. He has built uh, constituencies. Uh, when he first came up, his first uh, co-chair the first time was a prominent Latino. Uh, so he has done a lot of the work in the communities. So now that he's being attacked for school closing and other things, uh, he has some capital there. So uh, give Ram his due. He has been working those communities since the very first day. Both, both of the candidates, the big candidates, basically Garcia and Fioretti, um, have attacked Ram on crime. Uh, we, we saw Garcia's commercial where he's saying he would hire a thousand more uh, police officers. The crime issue really hasn't gotten a lot of traction. Why, why do you suppose that is? Well, I don't know, because when we consider the murder rate in this January past was more than last year's murder rate, so there certainly hasn't been any improvement. Although for 2014, the murder rate is actually down. The shootings are up from what Yeah, I exactly. So it just means that the people out there are as good a marksman. <laughs> I, think he's, I think he's also very lucky that the yeah, election's absolutely. in February. But it has and not improved. We were, yeah. The police situation is dire, not only in those communities, but as we mentioned, his own community, you know, the, the mugging of his son in front of his house. People don't feel safe. And why that hasn't become more of an issue, I don't know. You were saying that he's lucky because yeah. it's in February because of the weather. Because of the weather. People sure. are staying indoors. Um, summertime is a very yeah. dangerous uh, time to and be. And not only is she right, there are other places where they have elections in April, May. Some places have them on weekends where people can come out. Some places have them two days rather than one. Well, the only thing we have that's good is the early voting. Well, the, the issue on crime, and it's true, in the summer that's where you get right. uh, the shootings, all the crime right now. Uh, it's not an issue, and it hasn't been since uh, it would warm out. So it hasn't been in the news, so it's not in the minds of voters. You've mentioned uh, education, and all the uh, opposition to Mayor Emanuel is calling for an elected school mm -hmm. board. Emanuel would keep the appointed school board if he's reelected. Kristen, has that issue gained inroads? Do you think that's gotten any traction at all? I think it's going to have, I mean, it's, it's on the ballot in these wards just in an advisory capacity, but it's going to get overwhelming support. Um, I think, I, I would guess 75 to 80 percent. So it's going to put pressure on him to do something about that. I don't see that happening. You saw in the city council when they tried to put it on the citywide ballot, some of his allies crowded the ballot mm -hmm. with these other issues that are just ridiculous that you'll see um, the, the other advisory reference to crowd that one out. So right. I think it is motivated. I think you're going to see in certain wards, especially where you have heavy population of firefighters and teachers and police, that that will bring people out. Angel? Yeah, I think this is a great uh, issue for Chewy uh, because the people that are going to vote for that are going to vote for Chewy. Uh, this is, at the end of the day, uh, Chicago Teachers Union. People that are interested in that are going to go out and vote. If it's a very cold day where only very interested people are going to go out and vote, this could be the difference. I think this is an issue that's going to help uh, chewy, and it's going to push this to a runoff. Uh, and again, it's an advisory, so uh, any real uh, movement is not going to happen. But I think as far as uh, get out the vote right. instrument, I think it is very important. We're the only district in the state that does not have an elected school board. And we certainly have no reason to say, oh, well, this is better. This is something we definitely need. There is one issue on which all the candidates appear to be united, and that is the new governor of Illinois, who has just given a, a budget uh, speech in which he is talking about six billion dollars in cuts including big cuts to Medicaid to the state university and to cities so all of the mayoral candidates uh, seem to be opposed to that and Kristen do you think the new governor is going to have a battle no matter who the next mayor of Chicago is oh sure I mean they both have to you know protect their territory and Rauner is talking about taking away a significant portion of the income tax that goes to cities. That is going to be very tough to pass in the General Assembly because the lawmakers listen to their local mayors. And you're talking about taking away money from not just Chicago, but Calumet City, Lansing, Harvey, places where they don't have these big cash reserves that Rauner talked about. That's going to be a tough, tough one to pass. Mr. Garcia, you are the Republican on the panel here. I am. And whether it's Chewy or Rahm, uh, Governor Rauner is going to have a tough time getting this passed. Uh, again, we, there's little money, both municipal or state, so uh, taking any money away from the state and these smaller cities it, <clears throat> is going to be a battle. That's going nowhere. The General Assembly, I, I don't know whether uh, you know, Mr. Rauner needs to read the Constitution you know, and see what he can do. It was uh, interesting reading the rhetoric from all the candidates, and basically they all had a similar line 
which is that uh, the governor is trying to balance the budget on the backs of children and the poor. It didn't matter what candidate, they all basically said right. uh, the, the same thing. Is this an, an, effective, uh, an effective argument against Rauner? I mean, it's, it's effective rhetoric, but I would argue that the middle class has not been well served by the group that we've had in Springfield. They took 30 extra billion dollars out of our pocket over the past four years and still didn't manage to help the most vulnerable citizens. So, yeah, it sounds good to talk about balancing the budget on the backs of middle class uh, Illinoisans, but I would argue that's been happening. That is, that's what dysfunction looks like in Springfield. Garcia, um Chewy Garcia did have an interesting uh, take on this. He got in, into a dig. He says, it's important that the mayor stand up and tell Bruce Rauner, his wine-drinking buddy, that this is unacceptable. So well, does it play in the mayor's race? Well, I think it does. Yeah, yeah, I, I, does I mean, sure. this is a, a Democrat city. Obviously, attacking yeah. the Republican governor is going to be great uh, for all the candidates because they're trying to say, look, we're not with the governor. The, uh, the city went strongly towards uh, Quinn. So yeah, there, there's no downside to, to attacking uh, Bruce Rauner. But look, we see that we didn't get here overnight, and it was 34 years of that Mike Madigan in, uh, in power, but that doesn't play, right? Well, so well, I think one, they're doing what they have to do. One to thing get the that votes. Dr. Wilson said was the fact that although he supported Rauner, but he said on my radio show that although I support you, I don't support your friend, that guy in the, the mayor's office, because anyone who has disrespected the black community the way he has need not be the mayor. And if so the candidates had the any more money. It was a $10,000 bottle of wine. Yeah, and if the candidates had any more money, they could have yeah. run commercials showing yeah, exactly. Rahm and uh, Governor uh, Rahner together and exactly. making an issue about the wine and things well, like that. Well, as you point out, the money is the problem. We heard at the end of the piece there that the mayor's own personality seems to be a factor, that his personality is off-putting to, to some voters. Does that play a role here in this election, Kristen? I, absolutely. I mean, yeah. it's... It, Daily mismanaged the city, obviously with finances, but people liked him and they felt like he was a neighborhood guy and he won with 80% of the vote. You know, we haven't, we haven't ever had a runoff in the city. That was a law that was passed in 1995. We have mm -hmm. never even right. been able to apply it. So um, as much as you want to talk about Daly and, and how he handled finances, which is true, people liked him. And Rahm is just, um, he's, he's kind of a bully. I don't think he's paid attention to the south and west sides. No. When we, in all these debates, all he can talk about are a couple grocery stores here and there. He has not been laser focused on the communities, you know, that are most vulnerable that need city help. 30 and seconds, you know 30, 30 seconds left, runoff or not? We'll go right down the line. I say yes. Runoff. No. No runoff at all. I don't so, think so we're, we're divided on that. On that note, we have to wrap it up. Thank you very much to our guests, Kristen McQuarrie, Angel Garcia, and Cliff Kelly. This month marks the birthday of Illinois' most famous politician while we're talking about politics, and that would be Abraham Lincoln. The anniversary of his death comes in April, and the village of East Dundee decided to pay tribute in a very special way, taking advantage of Illinois' natural elements. Lincoln is obviously a very important person in the state of Illinois. Um, it's the 150th anniversary of his assassination, so we decided to do an event that was based around Lincoln. This small town northwest of Chicago commissioned an artist, one with a unique skill, to help celebrate the life and death of the country's 16th president. My name is Fran Bowles, and I'm a sculptor by trade. I work in bronze and other materials, but in the wintertime, it's fun to get out and, and work with snow. But the sculptor had a deadline, only 72 hours to complete a lifelike bust of Abraham Lincoln. Fran worked around the clock to have his snow sculpture ready for the town's Love and Lincoln celebration. Well, we started out with a block that's 10 feet tall, 8 feet by 8 feet, and they made a big solid block of snow. What we're doing now is we took measurements of the little model, of the clay model, and we transposed them onto the block in proportion. So now we're cutting away the sides of his head. Once that's done, we'll draw out the basic shape of his head with a magic marker, and uh, then we'll do the front and the back, and we'll chop those off. Chicago's recent bitter cold and that smattering of snow were the perfect combination Fran needed to mold his bust. But we have great weather. It's about 30 degrees right now. The sun's starting to shine. And it's supposed to drop down into the single digits tonight. So it'll be really good for carving. You can get really crisp edges. And it'll be just wonderful. That's where the pupil of the eye has to be. I measured it on the little model. It's going to be 18 inches wide between the two pupils. So that'll be my little reference point. I think it's great. Uh, I've been a long time Abe Lincoln fan. 
So I purposefully drove down here just to see it and take a picture of it. Three days after starting the project, Fran has finished scraping, hammering, and sawing the sculpture. Now he's ready to unveil his masterpiece. It is our pleasure today, truly our pleasure, to, uh, to introduce and welcome one of the greatest heroes of Illinois. We would like to dedicate this bust in your honor on the occasion of your birthday and for the service to your country. Good to know there is one popular politician still in Illinois. And one place they're glad for cold weather for a while. Right, it warms our hearts today on this cold day. To learn more about our show and today's guests, log into our website, wycc.org, and look for In the Loop. Well, that does it for today's show. Join us next week when we take an in-depth look at Governor Rauner's fight with organized labor. Until then, I'm Barbara Pinto. And I'm Chris Bury. Good night. Good night.